Collins speakers. I know they're kind of funny looking and not as common as our other speaker types, constant curvature, point source, line array, but nonetheless, they are speakers that we have to deal with out in the wild. And sometimes they are the perfect solution for specific situations. And we're gonna talk about those today. They have really great control over their sound. They blend into their spaces and have some other unique features that we'll cover. If you wanna get the best results out of your sound system, you can't just rely on your ear. You need to know the math and what's going on and make sure your system is setting yourself up to succeed for your show. And so that's why I created the Audio Math Survival Spreadsheet. You can get that at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit or snag it at the link below. It is able to measure how sound works in the real world and it works progressively throughout the spreadsheet. So you can start to get comfortable about how frequency corresponds to period or cycle time or wavelength or how phase delay is calculated so you can align mains and subs. You can start to get more comfortable with decibels and how they relate to another so you can easily do calculations in your head and not have to go back to a calculator or just not know what decibels do anyway. So I would love for you to put this to work, get it at the link below and start to truly understand how sound works. And then when you get to a rig, you're not confused about placement. You can know how things are going to work together and make it sound its best on your shows. Colin speakers, here we go. First up, what in the world are these things? I will argue they did a great job naming these because the speaker looks exactly like it says. It is a column of speakers here in that little yellow box. It's kind of hard to see because one of their main benefits is that they're pretty incognito in an install situation. You'll see them in a lot of churches. This is actually the church my sister got married in, but they're installed here. This is the Meyer Sound Cal speaker that we have, the Column Array loudspeaker. They had the longest one installed here, the Cal 96. And what you can see is a bunch of small drivers stacked on top of one another. I don't know the exact sizes. I think they're four inches, maybe two inches. I don't know, but it's basically a, a small, medium and large version. And they all give you a varying amount of SPLs. So the more drivers, the more volume, that's pretty intuitive, right? But you also get more directivity in a line source if you have a longer line. This was discovered by a guy named Harry Olson a long time ago. He also pioneered cardioid subarrays and did some really cool stuff, but he did a lot of math for us to help figure out that these speakers behave in a certain way, which we'll get into. But before we talk about the behavior of line sources, let's talk about point sources. When someone says, hey, give me a point source speaker, they're probably talking about one of these, just a normal run of the bill speaker on a stick, a eight, 10 or 12 inch woofer with a tweeter. That is the colloquial term for a point source. But if we dive down a little bit more into the nitty gritty of it, what they're talking about is this phenomenon, is that sound is gonna emanate spherically, this is a 2D slice of that, from a single point. So if we blow that up into a sphere, we see what's the wave front of moving from a single point. So a small little point right here, and then it's emanating out equally in all directions. That is a point source. But we all know that our main speakers, the high frequencies are easy to steer. They are not going out equally in all directions. They're doing this. They're going towards our audience. So this is four kilohertz. So right in the middle of the intelligibility range, and it's going toward our audience in a nice pattern. So we have that going out here and is not going here over on the stage, which is great because we want the sound at the people listening to the show and the sound not going other places like the wall ceiling and bouncing around or back under our stage, which would cause feedback. But low frequencies, because of their crazy long wavelength, a 31 hertz wave, the very bottom of your sub range is 36 feet long. That's as long as a school bus. It's very hard to steer that with physical means. How we're able to get this to go in a certain pattern is with something called a waveguide. It physically steers how the sound is moving out into the space. So low frequencies are hard to steer because of their wavelength. And in this situation, if this speaker is hung about 12 feet above the stage, we have a two foot high stage, we actually have stronger amounts or more 40 Hertz on the stage than we do have in the audience. So our 4K is getting steered nice and clean out to the audience, but since the speaker is not long physically, it cannot steer it out. So what about line sources? How can they steer energy because of how long they are? So let's dive into that. So here I've got one sub, we're looking top down here, and this is at 63 Hertz. This is right in the middle of the sub range. So it's gonna move omnidirectionally equally in all directions out from the source. 
Now let's add seven subs with a two foot spacing in between the drivers. We see what used to be this perfect nice sphere, and these are 3DB separations between each color, is now squished down into this donut. So now it is moving out into a squish pattern at a 116 degree angle. And how I measured that is I use a tool called Pixel Stick and I put it here on the screen. I got to the end of the green and then I need to move off two colors with the same length to figure out that angle. So I just rotated this around at the same length. I got to the edge of my blue and here at the edge of that cool blue and that's 6 dB off and that gives me my angle. I did it from the other side. So I've transformed what is basically 180 degrees in this each direction, 360, and now it is 116 degrees. So we're tightening the pattern simply by adding more subs. So we're of course adding more SPL, but it's gonna affect the pattern. So now let's go crazy. We've got 19 subs in a row. So now we have tightened this down to 46 degrees and we are getting this little nose on our coverage. So if I went here from orange, yellow, green, so that's 60B down. And that gives me a 46 degree coverage pattern. And this is true for drivers and frequencies of all sizes. So these are, I think, 15 inch woofers in this particular sub that I have here. But we saw in our column speakers, it, these tiny little drivers. So let's put all those in a line and it does the same thing, but just at higher frequencies. So we can start to steer frequencies in a meaningful way. And why is this helpful to us? Because we want the sound at the people we're directing the speakers out and away from bouncing around and on the stage. So this gives us a higher signal to noise ratio. We're not having to listen through a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter. Um, it's more efficient. We can use less SPL because it's not wasting some going everywhere. So there's a lot of pros to being able to use the physicality and physical nature of the speaker and how it combines to steer energy where we want it and not where we don't. So we can actually predict how beamy, how tight and focused or blobby a source is. This is a, a nice little shorthand. The calculation is, is a little bit more complicated than this, but you can just know that it'll work out for you here, whether you're shorter or longer in, in length here. So 31 Hertz is equal to 36 and a half feet. And so this line length here of 19 subs is equal to that. And that gives us 72 degrees of directivity. So this is true, you know, 1K is 1.13 feet. So if I had a bunch of tiny little drivers all <laughs> in a row uh, for 1.13 feet, I'd be able to get 72 degrees of directivity. So this just scales with size. So there's 15 inch woofers. This is able to scale them down to the smaller driver. So therefore steer higher and higher frequencies. So which of these models has the most directivity across the largest frequency range? You guessed it, the longest one. So longer the line, the more directivity you have. This is not always desirable, especially in a subarray. I may not want that point on it, but I just wanted to illustrate that the longer the speaker is, and you have a bunch of speakers all in a row, they're gonna behave close to a line source. We can never get perfectly there and get to a perfect cylindrical wave front. But this is the longer the line, the more steering we have. So this is that same Cal 96 speaker, the long one, and we're looking at its vertical coverage. So I opened the Ease Focus, uh, the GLL file in Ease uh, GLL viewer, or sorry, in just GLL viewer, and we can see that this is a nice tight 30 degrees all the way down here to about 125 hertz, which is awesome. We don't get anywhere near that with a single point source. We're seeing that here. So this axis is cutting across here. That's 125. So we know that about that frequency is where things start to getting less directional. And it moves, stays in that nice tight 30 degree pattern vertically up until about 16K and then it gives up. And that's in the documentation. So I say from 125 Hertz to 16K to have that type of beam is very impressive. We can also look at the horizontal pattern. That's something that we see in Collins speakers as well, as most of them have very wide patterns. There are some out there that I've worked with that have 160 degree wide patterns. So this is boasting, yeah, it's got 120 degrees, but at what frequencies and how consistent? I'd say this graph does tells you a really good job of saying that, hey, this is going to be consistent. So this truly is representative of a very small, squatty cylinder <laughs> that's unfolding out in your space. It's not a true cylindrical wavefront, but it's closer than our blob of sound from a single subwoofer or point source in the low frequencies. 
but Colin speakers have even more directivity tricks up their sleeves. They can also tighten the beam even further. That, G, uh, that GLL file we looked at earlier, which was that same Cal96 speaker with that at 30 degrees, it can use special processing, either through the use of FIR filters or all-pass filters to steer the phase relationships between each of these speakers and make it even tighter. Because why we have a beam in the first place is because there all these speakers along here all r arriving here at similar points in time so they are summing together but the farther we have you know this driver here at the bottom is going out and it's not a close in level or arriving close in time over here so we're going to get start to get cancellation towards the top but all of these have some amount of energy arriving here in the middle so that's how we get that beam but within the processor on this speaker within the compass control software and other companies have similar control softwares to steer their beams on their speakers we can get this super tight and focused so we can put the sound exactly where we want to put it so we can open this up to a 30 degree beam as well and another trick is you can actually steer it so this is further altering the time values to steer the beam up where we need it so maybe we could not put the speaker in the best install location so we have to put it low and steer it up high to a balcony you have to put it high and steer it down low to the front row so that's it's a very flexible speaker that's almost like a sniper rifle so if a, a normal point source box maybe a 75 degree by 75 degree is more like a shotgun this is a sniper rifle we can also use on this ray a way to double the amount of beams so we can steer one towards uh, maybe a balcony and the bottom of the array towards the front row. You get more SPL on the top beam because you're usually having to throw that farther to an audience that's far away. But it's it's really cool how granular and specific you're able to be with column speakers, especially ones that are more advanced and pricey like this, where you can really fine tune the coverage to exactly where you need it. Another pro is that they're also sleek and easy to hide. So installing them in environments like this that we saw earlier, these blend right in and do a great job of, of blending into the space and providing coverage uh, throughout the entire thing. So again, it's just one tool in the toolbox. It's not the end all be all, but it is a great tool to have. So let's, let's review some of the pros then jump into some of the cons. So first, line length keeps energy off walls in the ceiling and towards the audience. So that's less energy bouncing off the walls and mucking things up. It's going directly towards the audience, which is where you want it. It has flexible coverage areas. So maybe you can't put it in the optimal positioning, but you can steer the energy where you want it. Super cool. Number three, it's compact. It can blend in with installations. And number four, it also has wide coverage when you need it. Most point source boxes, unless you're taking a line array box or constant curvature array box off there, aren't the widest things in the world. Your run in the mill K12 or maybe a PRX speaker that you have off the truck is 60, 75, maybe 90 degrees wide. So this is 120. And so if you need really tight vertical, but also wide horizontal coverage, this is the box. I am aware that there are other speakers out there that are point sources that are wider than that, but it is not as common as something that's more middle of the road. So here are the cons of this speaker type or column speakers. They have lower SPL than their line array counterparts. They're not designed for big racks and stack show. Uh, they are primarily made to reproduce the voice very well and make it clear. So you'll see these a lot in airports and churches that don't have rock bands or other corporate settings where they blend in, they point the sound exactly where you need it and they get out of the way. So there are uh, very transparent in that, that sense, both from an install and sound steering perspective. You also need a boundary for adequate low frequencies. So if I go back to this slide, column speakers want to have a boundary behind it to take advantage of the half space loading, basically the low frequencies bouncing off the wall behind it and coupling and going forward out into the space. The more expensive or better speakers may have better low end built in, but some, this is why you see on pro audio websites that have home speakers, we call they call them bookshelf speakers. They call them bookshelf speakers because they're literally supposed to be on a bookshelf because they need, they're designed to have that back wall helping out with the low frequencies, bouncing back with it and providing support. So you may not be able to get the beefiest sound out of these unless they are against a wall. Number three, there's lots of parts. So it's possibly more maintenance and things to worry about. That's a whole lot of drivers and it's a little bit harder to troubleshoot and see if a driver is out. And the more drivers you have out, the less 
it's going to, to work well. That's that's pretty obvious. So I, I've never personally owned or used these a ton, so I don't know how often they break, but that's just something that comes to mind when thinking about how complicated and intricate the speaker is in its design. This may not be the case, so fact, me, fact check me here if you, you have otherwise have experience with them holding out really well. Number four, there's not as plug and play as a point source. So if I'm on a show where I have very limited setup time and it's a, we don't have to be the most transparent from a sightline perspective, I'm okay with just throwing up a speaker, a point source and going. These are usually in install situations where you have time to carefully choose a speaker, carefully place it where you can and use software to steer it but um, don't use these as a quick run and gun type of thing. Okay, here are the key takeaways and then we will wrap up. These are a wonderfully specialized tool. So it is one tool under tool belt as you're designing systems that you're gonna work with or just be familiar with if you have to end up with this one. It has a wide horizontal coverage, very tight, vertical coverage. You can steer the sound where you want it. And remember, the longer the line, the lower in frequency we're able to steer that. You have total pattern control. So I talked about that. It's, it's, it's really cool to be able to put a speaker. We don't see it physically change, but because of the processing and the physics of how a line works, we're able to steer sound. That's, that's really, really cool. And number three is a chameleon. It can blend in easily with its surroundings and be pretty incognito. All right. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Michael Curtis. Please make sure and grab my audio toolkit at the link below and I will see you next time. Hope you enjoyed column array speakers.